Hey everyone, um, thank you for joining this uh, this session. Um, it'll hopefully be a couple of two or three interesting um, people to talk to you. Um, me perhaps in third place, but I'll start you know, get the boring bit out of the way for you, and then get into the good stuff. Um, so just after I'm Chris Croucher, I'm CEO of Just After Midnight. Um, we are the go to twenty four seven support people for digital teams. Um, I thought I'd just spend twenty minutes today. Um, just telling you a bit about our thoughts on um, what it takes to run a really successful 24 seven support operation. It's a bit of a different uh, topic to perhaps some of the topics today. Um, we do a lot of uh, support for people who are working with Drupal, both uh, digital agencies and people who are delivering Drupal projects uh, and clients too. Um, so just um, want to take you back to a time before just after midnight or jam to a friends um, existed and just give you an insight into what drove us to create such an unusual business. Um, and perhaps how support can be done better without the headaches. Um, so up until about um, four or five years ago, I was um, uh, myself and my business partner, in fact, who's based in the UK. Um, I'm based here in Australia. Um, we ran a digital agency. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of clients we were working with were enterprise and government clients and uh, non um non-profit organizations, um, all of whom are looking to use digital in different ways to advance their organization's priorities. So we spent a lot of our time doing all the kinds of things that you probably expect a digital agency does, um, some of them do, um, research and uh, user experience, um, ultimately building and delivering and maintaining content-driven websites using platforms like Drupal and others, um, transactional web applications and API-based applications native mobile apps and tablet apps, those sorts of things. And our customers at the time were people like BHP, um, big um, you know, global resources company, their global website, we, we, we built and ran for them. Uh, people like Immigration here in Australia, um, we built their online translation service booking platform, um, almost like Uber for translators. Um, and people like Fuji Xerox, who are a B2B, um, B2C um, printer consumables business, and we built their commerce platform. So lots of other clients like that, um, and, and many that were much smaller as well. But all of them had one thing um, in common, and this emerged particularly as we were growing as a, as a digital agency working with Drupal and other platforms. And that was that their audience had that reasonable, perfectly reasonable expectation that their services would be online 24-7. Um, and quite often and increasingly so, we found um, when we were responding to clients' briefs, responding to tenders, to RFPs, we were being asked some slightly scary things about what our service level agreements were, what our SLEs were, our guarantees, um, not just on hosting websites that we were delivering. Um, and ask, they were asking us to have developers available in the middle of the night or at short notice at any time of day or night. And that was, you know, pretty scary. Um, so we initially, we did quite a lot of different things um, to try and figure out how the hell we're we going to do this 24-7 support stuff when government clients and big companies and some smaller ones ask for it. Initially, we, we, we were quite naive. We were very focused on what we were good at, designing and building cool, cool stuff. Um, so we looked to partner on this 24-7 thing. Um, and the first place we looked was both inside our client IT teams and also our infrastructure partners, people who often would provide hosting or Cloud platform providers, um, you know, we were at the time a partner of Acquia um, and also some other platform providers that probably compete with them. Um, and we looked to them to, to help us. Um, the challenge, I guess, that we found was that they were really, the majority of cases, only interested in supporting the infrastructure that they provided. They were not interested and couldn't really build the capacity to properly provide 24-7 support for our application that we were delivering to the client, um, our integrations. Um, that um, were driving the client site, um, and neither were they willing to support the systems the client had in place that the website depended on. Um, and a lot of our customers didn't really care, you know, what, which component they just want twenty four seven support for the solution. Um, so that was a real problem. The other thing that we found ultimately that was missing as we kind of ventured down this path and tried to respond to these requirements um, was that those kinds of organizations were not interested in managing incidents relating to our client's platform at two o'clock in the morning you know so good like telling the client their site is down communicating with them keeping up the, that communication during an incident keep them appraised of the progress of an incident 
um, you know, gathering the right people together from wherever they need to resolve a problem and, and then providing some timely incident reporting specific to the root cause. That wasn't really available. Again, they were only really interested in supporting the servers or the platform they provided and not all the other bits around it. And of course, in this day and age, particularly more so today than ever, uh, where we're using microservices and content as a service and this is a service and that as a service, the architectural design of the solutions often has perhaps Drupal at the center of it, but perhaps has a number of other web of components rather than one monolithic platform. So bringing that support from one vendor is difficult. Uh, and that was a problem for us. Um, we also tried the whole devs with a phone by the bed kind of scenario that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, you know, we, we actually did have a support mobile in each location and we'd give that to nominated on-call staff. Um, that was challenging, part, not least because we didn't have operations in all parts of the world. Um, and so we were asking people to get out of bed. But of course, devs would do the classic things that, um, you know, all devs reasonably do, like turn the alerts off that give you alerts on monitors that tell you whether things are down or not because alerts are annoying. Um, and of course, they might not wake up or they might, um, heaven forbid, go to the pub. Um, so that wasn't really ideal point of view for some of these clients. The most stupid thing I think we did when we were thinking about support quite often was we would we would price it really high sometimes to try and scare the client off, um, scare them away from asking for 24 seven support. Uh, and at least if we do win it, uh, maybe we'll be able to afford to pay people to work late uh, if uh, the client does award us the work. And that was obviously a foolish thing to do, but um, it was it was a challenge and it is a challenge for a lot of organizations of, of a variety of sizes from independent Drupal um, digital agencies to, um, you know, to client side um, teams where perhaps they're a large organization and they have an IT organization, but not the skills to be able to support the application. This question continued to come up in client briefs and tenders and pitches. You know, what are you going to do just after midnight when dot, dot, dot? Um, my website goes down, there's a DDoS attack, something's on fire, aliens land. Um, and this was this question was coming at us from new clients and existing clients. And we thought, you know, there has to be another way. Um, and so as with all good ideas, we went in the pub, discussed this gap in the market and agreed there was a real problem. The idea for Jam was, was born. So a few years ago now, we began building this incredible team of developers and cloud architects um, to solve this problem. And today we are you know, now we're almost six years old. Um, we're well regarded in our market and we call ourselves to go to support people for, uh, for brands, um, for government organizations and other types of organizations and of course, digital agencies. Um, and support is very much the front of our ship, which is unusual in our market when you look at um, most people think about cloud and 24 seven, but often that's very infrastructure focused. And whereas we're, we're very focused on um, full stack support and being proactive. Um, it also building a team that delivers great full stack support to keep things up and running and live and performing. Um, the combination of developers, DevOps engineers, cloud architects that you need also enable us to do a couple of other things as well. So supports our front of our ship, but we're also running a great cloud management and DevOps as service business too behind the scenes. Um, so I just thought I'd share a bit of insight into how we thought about support when we began to develop this offering and you know go to create something better than what was on offer at the time. Um, we really thought about the value drivers that drive customers' decisions. And on one side, you had the sort of digital agency types, and you could probably apply this to anyone who really delivers things for clients not just agencies, um, software team, development teams, um, consultancies too. When we speak to agency MDs and um, digital team MDs, uh, heads of engineering, they're very focused on, you know, wanting the support for, uh, to protect their credibility, to make sure their clients are satisfied and happy and, you know, aren't, aren't, don't, and, they, and they trust them. Whereas on the client side, we find um, people are driven much more around needing support, thinking about, like if my site's down, I lose revenue. Those are obvious ones, but also often, more often than not, it's people's reputation and just not wanting to feel that sick feeling in the bottom of their stomach when they realize, well, the CEO emails them at 10 o'clock at night on Friday and tells them they just found the site down. Um, those sorts of things seem to almost cut, cut it more. So we had a good look at what the market offers um, at the moment. And if you actually look really hard at what the market offers in terms of support, most of it's isolated to providers who support the thing that they sell. Um, the hosting only is a common one. They'll only support the bit of the hosting they look after. Maybe a bit of the app, like Drupal Core or something, for example. Um, support can, tends to be quite reactive. Customers' experiences tend to be um, 
ultimately that um, I have to call, you know, if I'm the customer, I have to call you to tell you my things down for you to do anything. Very counterproductive. Um, and SLAs tend to be limited just to really super critical issues. Like, you know, the thing is literally down and that's it. Anything else is not is, is, is priority two and therefore should be dealt with in business hours, which isn't always satisfying to customers. So we thought a lot about how to do it better. And there's a few characteristics on the right hand side that we think are the kind of ingredients for a good um, enterprise grade support service for digital platforms. Um, the really key one there, honestly, is, um, is incident management, regardless of who is at fault. Someone who can just look across a stack, monitor it properly, get the smoke signals from the right monitoring, um, and actually manage an incident from cradle to grave and provide useful information back to the team that perhaps location but in business hours later. Um, those sorts of things um, are good ingredients for a good support operation. Um, for those of you who don't know us already, a few brands that um, already trust us are um, on the screen now. Um, a few people, most of, many of them we work in collaboration with uh, agencies and, and some of these are on Drupal. Um, so Department of Home Affairs, we recently worked with, uh, some of you will know Annex um, in Canberra, fantastic Drupal, uh, Drupal specialist agency. Uh, they do a lot more as well. Um, we provided the 24 seven support piece um, for, in fact, content, 24 seven content support in that particular case for a number of COVID-19 websites that some of you might have seen showcased here today or um, in the last session. Um, people like Transport for New South Wales with a, another agency that happens to use Drupal uh, and a variety more. So the takeaways really to finish, um, we think in terms of the great ingredients for a strong support operation when you need it are first, you know, you have to recognize, particularly if you're an agency and you're, you're going after a government tender or, or, or a pitch, you can't fake it when there are real SLAs. Um, you can't get away with having the phone by the bed. Um, so we, are, we often think about what are the value drivers for this client? Why would they pay for support? What will they pay? How important is this platform to them? And what is it that's important? What do we need to focus on? What, what constitutes a priority one issue? It doesn't necessarily mean the thing's down. It could be a really important thing that runs their business isn't working. Um, so we look at that. The other thing is um, a, there's a misconception that um, you know, customers always often ask you to provide developers in the middle of the night. And in reality, um, having people with development experience is very, very, very useful uh, in the middle of the night when something's gone wrong. But in the majority of cases, in our experience of six, five, six years worth of incident data, the majority of issues are not code issues in the middle of the night. <laughs> Frankly, a lot of them are very mundane, very boring, um, including people forgetting to renew SSL certificates and all that kind of stuff that most of us have seen from time to time. Um, so it's important to think about what really needs doing in an emergency. What, is, what does recovery from an incident look like versus actually addressing an underlying problem that is causing an incident, um, which could be dealt with during business hours? Um, and three, you know, um, in many cases, we encourage customers when they are looking for that kind of increased vigilance on support and response and ability to resolve issues. Think less about going and subscribing to Pingdom to tell you with the sites down and just hoping that the infrastructure provider is somehow going to deal with everything because they're 24 seven because they're not. Um, and think more about monitoring each layer of the solution. Um, get that data and then what organization, organizational operations are in place to handle alerts from those to be able to go address issues, uh, perhaps potentially before the train hits the car and the thing goes down if possible. Um, so what doing it better looks like for us, uh, no more of that phone by the bed bull, um, full stack monitoring, meaningful alerts. Um, and from an operational readiness point of view, just good integration between yourselves, the agency, perhaps the client and the, and the support team to, to share information about what changes are happening on that platform ongoing, planning for scenarios um, that, uh, that might occur in advance, um, participation in disaster recovery and rollbacks, those sorts of things. Um, so, for example, you know, in, in, in what we mean by this is from a proactive perspective in terms of getting depth on monitoring, if we have an AWS based stack, of course, Base, the basics, putting in things like CloudWatch for getting native da data out of the platform to give us smoke signals on the health of the infrastructure, implementing useful tools that tell us um, the health of, say, the Kubernetes cluster, if that's what we're using, and that's the flavor of technology you decide to go with. And then on the front end, obviously, endpoint monitoring for HTTPS uptime, but full page load monitors to tell us when things are loading slowly, uh, real user monitoring across a site to show us where bottlenecks are, form monitoring to check if forms are working properly. All this data is available to a service desk 24 seven, ideally, in our case it is, um, that are then able to act on that using customized run books that are designed around the, the client solution. 
um, and we forget about you know who is responsible for what, um, whether we can just serve the ticket back to the client and say, sorry, the server's agreeing, everything's fine. And we think more about outcomes focused and getting that thing back up, regardless of whose fault it is. And lastly, have a simple support flow. Design the support process. This is literally the simplest support flow that, um, that we have, but we've designed custom support flows with our clients. Um, so you've got that kind of obvious, you know, manually raised ticket, which is rare, or automated tickets that um, are generated by good monitoring. Um, have a service desk there 24 seven that can respond immediately. Um, our average response time is less than five minutes. Um, despite the fact that the best SLA we offer for a guaranteed response is 15 minutes. Um, because we're always there 24 seven uh, triage using run books and good decision trees and smoke tests um, to be able to establish quickly what issues exist and where and then begin to escalate to that level two technical team. And sometimes rarely um, perhaps engaging with the agency out of hours or um, engaging with a third party that perhaps provides a booking platform the site's dependent on. That's the job of our support. Um, so holistic support rather than just um, based on isolating one particular part of the platform. Above all else, of course, um, get the right team in place for support. Um, thanks for listening. Um, and uh, I'll hand over now to uh, to Dave and Luke. Hi, how's it going? Um, I am here uh, representing our sector distribution, um, and I'd just like to introduce uh, Eddie and Daniel from our team who are going to um, run us through a few slides just to give a little bit of background and um, explain what sector is all about. And then I've got Luke Percy here um, from our, our bitter rivals and good friends, uh, Catalyst. Um, and we're going to have a little chat at the end about what collaboration around a distribution might mean and, and how people who compete in the market can work to get the market a, a better place. So I'll hand over to, to Eddie and Daniel now, um, and they'll run us through some, some brief background on sector. Choice. Hi there, everyone. Um, can you hear us all right? Cool. Okay, so um, we're here today to talk about um, Sector, and Sector is a um, distribution that is available on on uh, Drupal.org, and it's um, it's something we've been working on for quite a few years. So we're going to run through a bit of about what it is. Uh, some of you might have seen it, but um, we'll give you a bit of an intro. So, um, who are we? Dave um, just spoke before. He's the owner and managing director. Um, he interviewed, had a really good interview with uh, Dries at the start of this Drupal South. Um, and you've seen them on today as well. Um, my name's Eddie Samuel. I'm primarily a site builder. I'm not a coder, um, but I've got an interest in UX and accessibility and privacy and stuff like that too. Yeah, uh, and I'm Daniel Beza. Uh, I'm a senior developer here at Sparks, and I also uh, am the sector technical lead. Um, so yes, Sparks has been around for a while. Um, not to say that we're old, but we've been around for a while. Um, and we've been working across different uh, sectors as well in private sector, non-profits, uh, community, and quite a lot of government as well. So that's who we are. So why did we start building a distribution and then why did we actually share it out as well? Well, um, like many of you, you've probably built a site and then you've built another site and there might be some similarities between that site. And by the third or fourth time you're building a site, you're realising you're doing 70 or 80% of the exact same thing again. And we thought um, quite early on that why don't we try and do this properly instead of having to reinvent the wheel every time? So it's a it's a distribution, as it says. Um, it's got a whole lot of pre-configured stuff that comes out of it, and we feel that it's a it's a very iterative product that we've been working on, and it's just been really good for us to be able to start um, at a, at the same point, which is really good for people who are coming new into the business um, or people who are just picking it up from um, Drupal.org that you know we're not having to explain things differently every time um it's really helpful in that way um and the, the, the sort of pre-configuring we do does align very well to 
majority of our clients, if it's government or private sector, they need a brochure page, they need a news section, they need a um, resources system, these sorts of things. So there's a lot of pre-configuration there that goes on. Um, you can have a look on um, Drupal.org uh, on the project there, the sector. There is a um, demo site with some demo content, um, and we're updating the code base uh, pretty regularly. Um, it's obviously a Drupal 9 release, but the sector goes back to Drupal 7 and in various incarnations back um, to uh, Drupal 6 as well. So you can have a look at the demo site um, at demo.sectornz or just the sector and Z site as well. So um, we just wanted to make things more efficient and uh, a, a better solid platform. Um, a lot of this came around from content, but we understood that, you know, content really is king. Um, we hear that banded around, but it really is. And when that comes down to content editing um, and keeping your content editors happy and fulfilled, um, we think that's really important. I'll show you a bit more of that stuff under the hood in a few slides time, but um, we just want people to be able to get in and, as I say, have these regular content types for things like news or content the same way that the, the fields would sit for each and it's been really useful for some clients who have clones of the site um, and or a, you know they use it as a, as a base product and have flavors or variants but the underlying structure is the same and that's really useful for content editors who work across multiple sites but uh, you know the field names and taxonomies are consistent too so it's really helpful um, we talk about sector, sector ecosystem, so I'll let Daniel jump in here about this. Cool. So, yeah, when we when we started building the Drupal 8 version of sector in particular, we really tried to change our mindset to not just have a distribution, just be code, and, and that's kind of it. We really wanted to focus on the editorial experience and also a whole, like it says, a whole ecosystem. So sector isn't just a standalone thing that you install and then walk away and, and do your own thing with. Um, the whole time, I mean, you can do that, but the whole time you can install things like events or contacts, all just with one module. Uh, like Eddie said, uh, once you've built an event content type, you're probably gonna build the same one again, or at least very similar based on the requirements. You're gonna have a map, you're gonna have you know a start and end date. So you know why click the buttons every single time? Now you can just uh, install the sector event module, for example. With a composer, install it, and you'll have your event content type already there with everything you need. Uh, and part of this opening, like open sourcing and the sector ecosystem, is also open sourcing our documentation. So this is really valuable at the sector.nz website. We've got uh, update guides, um, you know, justifications on why we did things, how our roles work. So you know, we can onboard new staff members, or we can onboard new clients. And if they have questions or, you know, we can even remind ourselves, you know, why do we do things this way or, uh, you know, how are things set up? We've, we've got everything open, everyone can see it. And it means, you know, when you go to Drupal.org and you want to use Sector, you're not on your own. You've got our backing and our documentation um, to go with us. And also, of course, the Slack channel where most of us are around as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, we know why Drupal.org works um, with the community idea about sharing back. Um, and this is, you know, just an extension of, of that and the, the, the open um, concepts there. It's also really useful for um, developers too. If we have developers, um, you know, new developers or seasoned developers, having, I think, what, pretty much all of our websites are built on sector. Yeah, everything um, in the last five years or so. Yeah, so, yeah. so there's a... The learning curve for figuring out a site for a new developer or, or for someone to own leave or emergency or um, DR sort of stuff, there's some really good consistencies, which is obviously efficiencies, which is obviously um, you know better for the client and better for the for the staff too. So all that sort of stuff just makes sense, um, and we put a lot of effort into it. And um, it's nice now to see people picking up sector and um, using it and asking questions as well, which is really why we're all in this, isn't it? Cool. So um, we talked about the sort of what you get when you download it. Um, if you download it, um, there's some, you can download it with PDF or you can just, you know, whatever approach you want to uh, install it with. But as you said, we've got some pre-configured content types and displays. Um, we use, uh, like Display Suite is used quite a bit, but uh, for each of those, you know, things like the pages, the news as a resource, you know, what are the, 
the consistent um, requirements that your clients or clients have for these sorts of content types um, and how do, how do we how do we have those so there's those are set up there um, we have sort of what we call the sort of the building blocks here which are sort of you know blocks on the home page um, dynamically taxonomical driven views or static views um, that sort of stuff have all those sort of sitting uh, views sitting there with with sort of vanilla starters even if they're not enabled as a view they might be there sitting as a disabled view which has uh, got a specific display mode or a useful um, case as well we use sort of page variants um, I heard someone talking about this in the one of the early Australian events as well um, you know page variants being a home page or a landing page or a section page um, and again the, the language and nomenclature that we use across these is very consistent so it's really easy to pick up these sorts of things um, and they have different display outputs for that um, we have a, like a, a content elements page you know like we look at all of the standard html elements and we we generally structure those in a very similar way across not to say that we don't expand everything for every website we have additions on top of that but the basic ones um, are fairly consistent and that's obviously a really good thing for um, accessibility and usability testing that we know that what we've got there works and um, we're, com we're compliant with it um, you know apart from things like design layers and contrasts and things like that but structurally um, it comes there yeah, out of the box um, so some of the other stuff that comes in the sector starter kit um, there's some sample content so this is a, an extra configuration stage on the on the sector just uh, the, yeah the sample content comes out of the box right yeah. All sides. yeah um so there's basic search and stuff there however you want to integrate that with elastic or uh, search api or solar as well um, there's media managers and again we've got sort of consistent approaches for images documents and videos not recreating different fields across different sites all the same um, metadata we set that up with some of the basic seo stuff for um, meta and og and been looking at chase and ld stuff as well lately um, but a big thing here is pre-configured user roles so we have consistent names for our user roles and the permissions across sites and that's really useful when you're dealing with you know 20 30 40 50 sites that we all know that a content administrator has these generic sort of roles and a content uh, content editor has lesser ones so that's a real easy way to um, troubleshoot uh, clients problems as well oh you're logged in as the wrong role it's not like a unique role per site all the time um, and just things like pre-configured text formats for CK editor and stuff like that you know a basic versus full html and what the permissions and roles sit around that so all that sort of stuff that you're not having to go through for testing and for um, go live checklists and things like that we're trying to get rid of that pain yeah it's, it's also uh the starter kit is also very uh iterative across releases uh when we finish a new site you know we'll say oh what didn't work for the site or what did work and if there's things that are generic enough and we can see that have a lot of value we'll try and fold them into sector as well or or an add-on if they don't really belong on the starter kit but yeah the, the goal really is to keep contributing back and just building the best product the way we can um we'll just have a quick show here this is just a single page you can see more of these on the um the sector nz on the case studies page um but as i said non-profits government tourism brochure sites there's bird of the year there which is an interesting um gatsby one which you might have heard our other colleagues talk about um that is a super configured web form and it got something like fifty thousand submissions over the week yep. week or so like that it happens each year so that's a um quite a nice sort of headless um gatsby and it's a react on the front end isn't yeah, it? yeah fully, fully decoupled fully, yeah fully yep. decoupled um so that's pretty cool it's got some verification processes government sites like the ombudsman which has got some bespoke um again web form and security uh things around it and then various other government sites but there's lots more we thought we'd just show you that off the sector site so um what we might do is ask you guys if you've got any questions to chuck them into the panel in the meantime we've talked about the sort of the shiny glossy side i thought we'd just show you a couple of um you know geekier snapshots of some of the stuff we're working on because um like all of us we're trying to figure out how people do things and that's the good thing if you want to download sector and look how we do it uh, that always increases your knowledge about how other people do things i remember doing that with things like um commerce kickstarter and lightning and thunder and, and GovCMS and all these sorts of ones you know see how other people do things 
So one of the add-ons we've got for sector is called sector content order. And we've always found harking back to this, um, keep the content editors happy. It's very vanilla. And if you gave it no love, um, they would give it no love and people wouldn't know where content is. Um, so we just added a couple of extra things to uh, a process. And this is really good for migration sites too, is that if there's a, a bigger site and you've got a, a, a migration job or a review content review site, you need a bit more, uh, you need some more tools to be able to do that. So we've added some things that appear in the sidebar, some, some text fields, um, some checkboxes, and then incorporated those back into just the, the backend content views, um, which gives people some confidence that stuff has been reviewed or there's a review date um, and what status things are in as well, if they're in draft or in progress, um, et cetera, or need to be replaced. So that's a, a nice add-on that often gets added to sites, bigger sites for clients. Um, this is a media audit. So this again is giving more love to these backend audit screens. The media one is very vanilla. You sort of see the, the thumbnail and the title and maybe an updated date, but we've added some more stuff here around um, size and width, alt text, which is really good for auditing accessibility uh, at a basic level anyway. Um, credits and captions, things like videos and stuff come up in here as well. But um, there's a couple of other things we're, we're looking into at the moment around um, media directories um, and assigning content into media, uh, into um, media ones. So here we go here. Um, we've got an option here to choose a directory, which is actually just a taxonomy term. And then it's actually creating this path in the uh, file system. Um, this is still early days yet, but this is really good for, again, auditing and um, just you know, keeping things in places, which means they can be audited. Uh, and that's been really interesting too. The other thing we've been working on top of this is if you unpublish content, we've all got that problem with as soon as you upload content, um, upload media or files within media, they're published and accessible. Um, some clients need to have embargoed or access controls on those. So what we've got at the moment is if a media entity is unpublished, the corresponding file will be stored in the private system. So um, just some ideas around trying to make things more secure and give more confidence back to content editorial processes. Uh, another thing here is just really sort of visually highlighting unpublished content and some additional tabs and love to the media work or content workflows um, process as well, just sort of seeing really visually what's happening um, for that content. And that's something we're working on too for media as well, because as I've been saying, we've been looking at unpublished and published media more than Drupal Core is um, the standard approach to it. Also with our access and workbench access. So, um, lots of things going on with Sector. I think we'll just jump in here. And has anyone got any questions? So, uh, if no one's got any questions, I think we can uh, pass back. But long story short, go and have a look at sector.nz. You can look at the sector distro on Drupal.org. Um, you can play and explore and um, give feedback. You can also see us on the uh, sector uh, Drupal Slack channel as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely try it out. We love to have other people, uh, you know, trying it out. We've had other companies. Uh, come talk to us after having tried Sector, and yeah, we're always we're always keen to hear other people's perspectives and you know what they liked and what they didn't like. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eddie, Eddie and Daniel. And uh, and in line with that, I thought around the the contribution and uh, uh, governance ecosystem. I'd just like to introduce uh, Luke Percy from Catalyst. I'll let you uh, say a few words about yourself there, and then maybe we'll have a chat about how it works um, collaborating. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so, yeah, look, our you know the CMS industry and you know is is getting a lot more complex, and our market, our clients, are definitely coming to us with you know wanting more value add, and um, a distribution like 
um, sector really gives us a bit of a head start um, when uh, going into these um, these builds. And um, you know, our team at Catalyst, we are you know huge advocates for you know well maintained uh, and local open source uh, projects like this. And I think what you guys have done and, and your approach and the, the iteration really does help that community kind of build on that knowledge base. And we're sharing ideas. Um, you'll see that in our uh, merge requests and things coming through the sector, and we may not agree, but we're having good conversation when we're yeah. developing our sites. And it only just bolsters our capability in, in, in the community. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 definitely something that uh, we're going to be learning more about um, and, and, these, and introducing more features from various clients. Um, the project that we're working on at the moment is quite large um, and we'll be taking Sector uh, on our own, um, you know, CI, CD platform and um, seeing how that works and maybe contribute back to that as well. So it'll be, um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing where we can take it. Nice. That that's awesome. I mean, we we've uh, at Sparks we've long had a, had a belief in open source and and not just from an altruistic perspective. I genuinely believe that publishing in the open makes you better. You have mm. to do your best work. You know, you've got you access the galaxy brain, and um and and people bring you solutions you could never come up with yourself. It's always a challenge though. I don't come from a dev background. I'm mm. a I'm a I'm a project manager and. Um, and a, and a business guy um and and always it used to be that when we take over sites um or even look at sites that we built a couple of years ago the developer was always like ah someone else did this you know, we have the, <laughs> the pre-developer is the is mm. the, the catchphrase in our place um i'd be interested to know what your experiences were like with your dev team who are uh, uh stable yeah. high performing drupal <laughs> drupal drupal people at their best yeah. You know, yeah. was there any resistance? How did, how did they go taking on someone else's yeah, like, code? Yeah, exactly. And we've like, and, and the developers do like my team, we have a mix of mindsets. You know, we've got, um, like you're saying, we've got, you know, top industry guys, you know, and then we have new people. Um, and these uh, mindsets, yeah, some of them like to play with code and would like to build things from scratch. Um, but what this offers them is to build the fun stuff from scratch. We can fit that in rather than doing everything from scratch. You know, like you're, you're, uh, you're doing your news article components. You're doing, you know, every project just seems to be, why are we doing this again? When we could be doing that cool integration with, uh, you know, this third party service that they can throw away and not use because it's on their web platform, you know? So it gives us that opportunity to spend the time on what is super valuable to our clients and, and give them that value add. And um, it gives us a, a nice solid, you know, uh, common, like with you guys in our market as well, you are delivering to the neighbors of that agency as well. And we now have this common ground that, hey, look, if they do, because it's open source, they own it, you know, and they could move vendor, we'd see it, and if it's sector, we know it and we can share back again, you know, it's, um, you know, as, as, as it happens in the, in this business, it's, it's small in New Zealand and uh, we end up seeing the same code, you know, we, <laughs> every three years we're seeing something that, you know, someone else has worked on and, um, and then back again in the circle, uh, it happens. So having that common language uh, that was mentioned by Eddie, you know, it's, it's, you know, it'll be quite beneficial. Yes. I I think back to the early days of Drupal and that mm. lack of vendor lock-in was a real, a really big selling point, especially selling mm. to the public public sector, um, who'd been burnt by proprietary CMSs mm. over the, the preceding ten or fifteen years. Um, but then with with Drupal seven and the proliferation of modules and the um, the range of experience that was out there in terms of who was doing Drupal dev and the mix of Drupal and the the, the propensity Drupal seven had to get mixed up with custom PHP. Mm. Um, that super frustrated us. And so, mm. um, to get back to those days of, um, people work with us cause they want to, not cause they have to, 
Um, mm. I think that, that, that having a good common distribution really does reduce that vendor lock-in. And mm. that was the deliberate thing from us. There's, there's very little um, proprietary code in, in sector. It is largely using um, mainstream Drupal modules, um, the most supported, the most easily maintained modules. Mm. And so, like you say, the ability to pass sites around, um, the sites that, that we work on last for ages, probably too mm. long sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, it, yep. but it's nice that you can go back to them and maintain them. Yeah. 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 Mm. I think it's it's super exciting for us um, that we've got, uh, like you say, our neighbours working on big projects, um, bringing fresh views, fresh mm. fresh approaches and challenges to that code base. Um, so yeah, I think that um, I'd be interested to hear kind of whether you've had any thoughts about the future and and what you'd like to see. Yeah, well, I um, I think. Uh part of this project we're, we're currently doing um, will require quite a, a, an accessible site and working more in the accessible areas of, of, of sectors such as ARIA labels and customizing things and um, looking at the templates and how you might you know do that and, and then the, there was good good sort of foundational accessibility in there um, that we can build on and uh, also uh, you know, content security policies, uh, things like that, and um, seeing how we can work those. And these are going to all come up over the few months that we're, we're on this. And as we learn more about it, um, we also like to use it as a good education tool uh, for our more uh, entry-level staff and um, getting them sort of building, you know, and getting used to uh, as builders or, or developers. You know, we kind of got a little split there. Um, mm -hmm. But they can all talk the same language and start learning on the same same sort of foundation yeah, mm. yeah. nice awesome i can see that we're just getting the, the hurry up um on the yep. clock here to, to wrap up our session so <laughs> awesome. I'd, I'd love to i'd love to continue this conversation with you over a beer or uh, yep. and, and everyone out there in the audience as well yeah um, sounds good but yeah i just want to say thanks thanks for jumping in and joining us on the session thanks for no, coming thank on board the, the the sector journey and i think it um you know, I come away from this conference always feeling energized and, mm. and super inspired about Drupal and, and what we can do. Um, and looking forward to working with, with you at Catalyst and, mm -hmm. and pushing sector forward with that energy. Thank you. No, us, to, us as well. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Wonderful. See you later. And thanks to Eddie and Daniel for the presentation. So good stuff. Hit us up in the message hub or uh, you can always follow up at sector.nz if you've got any questions, want to give it a go. Um, criticism, we'll take it. Um, you know, we, we love feedback and we love to know what we can do better. So, thanks very much, everyone.